slide, the cover slide, you can see all these dots on a map of the US. In 2007, there was one gender clinic for children. That was when the first one opened. Now there's over 60 comprehensive clinics, in other words, multifaceted, you have endocrinologists, surgeons, et cetera, as well as dozens, some would say hundreds more individual practices that are engaged in this. So we have seen an explosion in medicine just embracing this concept of, quote, gender affirming care. So I wanna give you some facts. Someone had asked a question that we didn't get to in the, in the uh, question period, saying, well, how can we talk about this, right? We're not experts, how, how do we have any credibility? Well, there are some basic facts that are really obscured in the cultural narrative. Anyone can talk about facts. It's a scientific fact that we're biologically male or female and you can't change it. And I'll give you some talking points on that. But have confidence that a lot of this is spin and the, the sort of aura of expertise that has silenced good people from speaking the truth. So with that, let's begin. Um, it's important to realize that that tremendous growth from one clinic in 2007 to now, you know, over 60 multifaceted clinics has been fueled by cultural forces that are creating a market. They're driving this. And so social media, schools, some of our afternoon speakers will talk about that. I just want to mention a couple of things about medicine in particular, how that is contributing to this problem and really creating the combination of the three things, social media, schools, and the medical slash counseling field has created a, a pipeline, sort of just fueling this rise. So a couple of things to know that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Pediatric Endocrine Society, the, um, the specialists in the field are all promoting what they call gender screenings for every child. Kaiser Permanente is into this in a big way. In fact, I saw a stat, I didn't have a chance to put on the slide here, but the, the two um, medical systems that have the most going on in terms of medical transitioning are the VA system, because you've got the government's backing behind this and, and they're extending this kind of care to uh, minors, dependents, families, as well as service members. And um, Kaiser is number two, because they have multiple locations and they have uh, engaged in this, both in terms of producing research, experiments, and, and things like that. So the point here is that your, your friendly pediatrician may be a lovely person, but you need to find out for your kids or your grandkids where that person stands on something like uh, the idea of whether someone can change sex, whether someone really can identify as someone other than the sex they're born as. What do they think about gender-affirming care? And use that language to say, what's, what do you think about that? If they are in favor of it, you need to be really, really cautious because here's what gender screening means. It means these physicians are being encouraged that when a child comes in, any child from some docs say age 10, some say age 11, whenever the child comes in and they're about that age, whether they come in for a sore throat, a broken arm, a physical, uh, you know, a, a twisted ankle, they're supposed to get time alone and do a gender screening. Time alone is where the doc turns to the parent and says, you know, give me a few minutes. Is it okay if I talk to your child for a few minutes? You know, just the two of us. And most parents, there's actually research on this, most parents believe that when they tell the doc, okay, sure, and leave the room, that the doctor is going to tell them whatever might have transpired in that conversation because they will believe what oftentimes the, the doctor puts out as a justification. Look, sometimes kids are more forthcoming about things that could be dangerous to them, et cetera, if mom and dad are not in the room. And there's sort of an intuitive sense that we say, okay, that could be true. 
But the problem is this, if you voluntarily leave the room, that doctor does not have to tell you what went on in that conversation because you have forfeited your right even to the records of that conversation, okay? So you, one, parents stay in the room, but number two, you need to know where your doctor stands because when doctors screen, it doubles the rate of kids who are, quote, transgender. In other words, when they screen, they find more kids who they then refer on um, for treatment. So be aware, and look at the kinds of questions. Imagine being a 12-year-old boy, and you get this doctor who you came in for, I don't know, acne, and, and um, the doc asks the mom to leave the room, or the dad, and, and so it's you and the doc, and you really don't know this doc well, and then they start saying, oh, so I noticed, you know, you tick the box that you're, you're a boy. How do you feel about that? Are you sure? Are you really? You know, I, talk about it, inducing insecurity and instability and self-doubt. So it's insidious. It is uh, really problematic. So realize sometimes the medical profession is part of the problem. And we can see that these, these contagion factors have produced these high rates, at least of self-declared uh, transgender identification. The other thing to realize is there is an official relationship in many cases between the gender clinics in a particular city and the public schools in that city. So for example, in Chicago, the big gender clinic is Lurie Children's Hospital. They do trainings for the teachers in the Chicago public schools. They, and they um, are listed as a resource for parents, for, for kids, but the teachers then learn that what they do when they have a quote gender uh, or a transgender kid they don't have to tell the parents unless the kid says, yes, you can tell the parents. They know where to refer them. They refer them to Lurie. So it's this mutuality of the gender docs or people on their staff coming in and quote training, because everyone needs training now to make sure it's an inclusive, welcoming place. So you have the professionals connected with the clinics coming in and doing the training in the schools. And then the schools in turn referring people into the pipeline. It's, it's an unethical situation, but it is the reality, in, certainly in most of the urban areas. So how does this medical path begin? It oftentimes begins with a child simply saying, announcing in one way or another, I'm trans or I'm non-binary. But oftentimes very quickly following that announcement, it could be within seconds, it could be within days, there's also the request to transition, to get hormones, puberty blockers, whatever it might be. And the reason is this, when kids are being encouraged to quote, explore their gender, in other words, you don't know if you're trans unless, unless you try it out, or the fact that you're thinking about it and wondering is a sign that you're trans. There's all these, these uh, social encouragements that make it more likely for every kid to think maybe I'm trans. In fact, there was a pastor who said, you know, when you take something that's certain and you make it a matter of choice, you get chaos. When you take something that's certain, like the sexual difference, male, female, sex can't change, that's certain, and you pull the rug out from under that certainty and you tell kids it's a matter of their choice, you get chaos. And I think it, intuitively we know that's correct. It's too big a burden. First of all, it's not true. These kids can't really self-create and become someone different. But what a burden. They don't have to wake up and just figure out what clothes they're gonna wear. They have to figure out, well, who am I today? And, and am I gonna express this? And what's, what's my gender and what are my pronouns? So life gets very complicated and heavy. So when a child says, I'm trans, usually there's a quick push to transition, whether it's social transition or medical transition. And as I'll talk about here, social transition is part of the process. It puts you on that conveyor belt. It's not some benign waiting room. It is part of the process. So one of the things as parents or, or uh, people working with kids, when someone comes to you and says, I'm trans, and then has that follow-up, I wanna transition, I think I need to do X, Y, or Z, one of the challenges is just 
getting them to slow down, listen to them, hear them, and then say, okay, you know what, we need to, we need to explore this. We need to take our time and think about this. There are some things I need to understand. You gotta slow that train down because they are being given basically a script, whatever is causing them to think this is the solution to their problems. Part of that script is you gotta do it now. All right, so when they say I'm trans, one thing I run into with families is, well, um, I, I don't believe really that people can change sex, but, but maybe there are some people who are really trans. Maybe uh, with that data that Dr. Sodergren was talking about, the fact that some people persist in these feelings through adulthood, a smaller percentage, but some people do persist. Does that mean they, quote, are trans? Well, no one is trans in the sense that no one is something other than male or female. What you have is a situation where someone may have persistent feelings through adulthood that are problematic, that cause them unhappiness, that cause them to need care and support to figure out how to integrate that with the reality of their lives. It doesn't mean, just because feelings persist, that they need to act on those feelings in a way that is damaging. And again, take this out of the politically hot charged area of gender. And think about it. We know that's true with all sorts of other things. Everyone has something, right? We all have our, our issues. So if you have someone who, who struggles with, whether it's self-esteem problems or addiction tendencies or whatever, that may unfortunately be the thing that they're going to have to struggle with. But just because those feelings persist doesn't mean that you go with this solution, this apparent solution of gender affirming care. Because as I go through this, the medical aspects, you will see it doesn't deliver on the promise, not just on the fact, the reality that you can't change sex, but it doesn't deliver on the promise of happiness and feeling better and living my authentic self. It just doesn't deliver. And there's, there's data on that, which I'll get to. So just first step back, be confident in the truth. Okay, you can't change sex. So what is this promise? Uh, my gender identity is different from my sex, therefore I want to transition. What, what we're seeing with young people is they really kind of believe you actually can change sex. You saw that in the data, 50% actually will report that to pollsters. But the vulnerable kids who are looking for a solution to their distress, all the other things going wrong in their world, they actually think maybe it can happen. And here's the reality, it can't. You can't change the cells in your body. You can change your appearance. You can disable or impair your natural function. You cannot replace and, and substitute the opposite sex functions. So a female who gets her vagina stripped out and gets a phalloplasty, which is a surgical tube of flesh that they attach, so it, it can, and they lengthen her urethra so she can stand up and try to pee, it's not a penis, okay? She has, does not produce sperm, it can't uh, get an erection, she can't ejaculate, she can do none of those things because you can't turn one kind of body into another. All you have is the appearance of it. And to reinforce this point, I'll point out that when you look at gender clinic informed consent documents, they do not promise to change someone's sex. I included one here. So this was a Planned Parenthood one, but the gender clinics run by the hospital, similar thing. All they promise is that they are going to feminize or masculinize your body. They don't say we're gonna non-binaryize your body, because what does that mean? Binary, sex, masculine, feminine. All we can do is change the appearance and restrict or disable your natural function. So be convinced you can't deliver on this promise of being or becoming the opposite sex or even escaping your natural sexed body, your sexual identity. You can't escape it, that is who you are. So one question we ought to be asking is, why shouldn't we want to help people try to work with those feelings and integrate those feelings into the reality of their body? 
And that is what science used to do. There was a political decision, uh, a political decision made in the 70s and 80s that they wanted to get away from this idea that the person who identified in a way that, that did not match their body was somehow either delusional, as they thought in the 60s, 50s, 60s. If you look at the research back then in journal articles, they talk about it as a delusion or dissociation from reality. In other words, it's not good, it's not healthy to have your feelings so disintegrated from your body. So that's how psychology talked about it at that time. And then for political reasons, in the, as the sexual revolution progressed and the psychological community threw out homosexuality from the DSM, the pressure was on to change how it was dealing with this practice. So the, the condition of having an identity called gender identity that differed with the reality of your body entered the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, in 1980. That was the first time it appeared. The number of cases were very small before then, but it became a diagnosis in the DSM. Again, DSM is a mental health diagnosis. Okay, so it was called gender identity disorders. Dr. Sodergren went through some of this. But again, the political pressure was such that the activist community said, you're pathologizing us. You're telling us there's something wrong with us. And we all have things that are wrong with us. We all have disorders, impairments. That doesn't mean you have less dignity. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be treated right. It doesn't mean you, you shouldn't get good medical care and, and be helped. But if you, if you view um, your identity as something self-defined and the only way you can feel like your identity is real is by getting external validation, then it matters if you're calling this a disorder or not. So the change was made, and I read the APA proceedings leading up to this change. They say specifically this was a political uh, move. It was not because there was some new research that said this is not a disorder. It was because they felt the disorder word was pathologizing and stigmatizing. So in 2013, uh, the DSM changed, and it took out the language of gender identity disorder and said, we're, we're going to say this is perfectly normal variant of human experience if your feelings differ with your body, don't match up with your body, but you still want a diagnosis code. Why? Because a diagnosis code gets you insurance coverage. It gets you medical treatment that someone else will pay for. So that was the reason to keep this in. So instead, the diagnosis code became, quote, gender dysphoria, which is distress. And as Dr. Sodergren went through those reasons why someone might be distressed, that, that could be very distressing. At the same time, within the transgender community, they're saying, well, not everyone who's transgender experiences distress. So now what we see is a push to get rid of the gender dysphoria language and instead to go with the language that we now see um, put out by the World Health Organization that's in the ICD, International Classification of Diseases, where they don't talk about gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria, they talk about gender incongruence. Another, and they moved it from mental health to sexual health. Again, political decisions where they're saying, we as a community, medical, psychological community, we're just observing you experience an incongruence, a mismatch between your feelings and your body. So we're just observing that. That's gender incongruence. But we'll give you a diagnosis code under sexual health so that globally, internationally, and in the latest WPATH guidelines, they go with gender incongruence. You don't even need to say you have distress or gender dysphoria. So this is, it, it's a... It's a series of changes we've seen that are designed to, um, to validate the idea that who you are is self-determined and I get to decide. And once I decide, I get to modify my body as I desire. And that's what the UN puts out. There's a, an independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity who has done a series of reports over the past couple of years on this particular question of gender identity. And the position the UN, for example, is taking uh, is that every person has the right to self-determine their identity. 
And upon self-determining your identity, you have the right to body modifications, to access medical care, to change your body, to match your, your personal self-perception. Okay, so unfortunately, the medical community, when people say, yeah, but, the AMA, the American Psychological Association, et cetera, they say some people really are trans. You have to understand that this is a labeling thing. It's a political movement. It's not because someone suddenly dis discovered that there's a different kind of person who's not male or female. They're male or female experiencing perhaps real distress, not trying to minimize that, but the promised solution, this body modification, is not going to change that reality. When you look at the, right, so right now here in the US, we're still working with the gender dysphoria diagnosis. When you look at the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in children, just note the criteria. It's about feelings and stereotypes. I desire to play with toys typical of the opposite sex. I prefer. I desire, I want, or at the bottom, I dislike my body or I want a different kind of body. That's, that's all it takes. And the reality is children are diagnosing themselves, children and adolescents. And how do we know? Uh, because one, the writings on this, the gender clinicians, the psychologists working in this area take the gender affirming stance, which is you accept what a child tells you as true. If a, a girl tells you, I'm really a boy, you as the adult or the parent should go with that. You should accept it, you should validate it, you should affirm it. And again, as Dr. Sodergren said, affirmation's a good thing, but we wanna affirm the person, not affirm this new identity they're trying to assert because it doesn't match with reality. So this is a, an image of Dr. Garofalo from Lurie Children's Hospital in Illinois, and he was doing a, um, a webinar about a year or two ago where he was, he was talking about the common question he faces when a young person, let's say a 13-year-old girl, comes in with her parents to his gender clinic. He said the first thing parents want to know is, they ask him, can you tell me, is this real? Is my daughter really transgender? then okay, maybe I'll get behind this. Because parents, a lot of parents are like, what the heck's going on? This is my daughter, she's not a boy. But they think, well, maybe there is this. Some people really are trans. So they turn to the doctor and they say, is my kid trans? And his point is, I turn to the child. And I say, who are you? Tell me who you are. And the child says, I'm transgender. I have gender dysphoria, I'm distressed over my body, my, um, my identity. So, but he admits, interestingly, I've got actually a file of admissions like this from these gender docs. They admit there is no test, there is no definitive marker or way to discern, even if you believed that there are really, quote, trans people. There's no way to show that someone, quote, is trans. It's all self-declaration. So. WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, is often held out as setting the standard of, uh, for care for people who are experiencing this disconnect between mind and body. And in their latest final guidelines that they just released, they too say there is no test, there's no protocol, there's no way to really know who is trans. And again, that's accepting their premise that somehow there's a different kind of person who's not really male or female, who's something else. They're destined to be, to reject their body and, and live um, in conflict with their body. So they admit there's, there's no way to know. So it's self-diagnosed. That's one of the first problems here. And again, uh, Dr. Sodergren went over this. We've seen changes in the demographics from older males and younger, younger boys to this dramatic rise in adolescence in particular, adolescent girls. So just to reinforce some of the points he made about background factors, why these things precipitate. You know, sometimes uh, people feel like uh, when a, a child is expressing a transgender identity, it means it's a terrible family. Not true. 
I know many great families whose kids have experienced this. What's true is that kids, all of our kids, have different kinds of vulnerabilities. And there are certain kinds of vulnerabilities that in today's culture become like a magnet for all of this trans propaganda. And at the same time, this child who is hurting or vulnerable is looking for a way to ease their pain. And this narrative that the reason why you're depressed, the reason why you hate your hips or your breasts or whatever it is, is because you're really trans and you can fix it, is really appealing to a young person who's in pain. So again, um, Abigail Schreier, if you haven't read the book, it's a great book. She's not writing from a Christian perspective. She just looked at a lot of the, the research and this phenomenon of adolescents in particular coming out and identifying as transgender, pointing out that much of this occurs in the context of heavy social media use, the social contagion factor, or kids who just don't fit in well and they're looking for a way to fit in. And the LGBT community is always looking for allies. So they join the club and they're an ally and then they get drawn into this. That's often particularly um, prevalent with kids who are on the autism spectrum. So again, just reinforcing some of the background factors. This, Dr. Sodegren so, showed the um, adult study. There is also a companion study on attachment issues in children and adolescents who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria. So again, in, in this population, 88% of these kids had pre-existing depression, anxiety, some kind of psychological issue. So they're, they're hurting vulnerable children. But also look at some of the other things. They may have suffered the loss of a loved one. Again, nobody at fault, but something that's unresolved that's causing them pain. The presence of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, bullying, and interestingly, the studies on bullying show it's a two-way street because kids who are bullied often turn out to be bullies, which further alienates them from other kids. So there's, you know, all of these things are very complex, but this is what tends to be in the background of kids who end up identifying as trans. Again, they're in pain, they're looking for a solution. The problem is parents are told, trust the experts. Go to the institutional experts here, the, the APA, the American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, and they all say gender-affirming care is the way to go. Even uh, HHS, the Biden administration just put out, has been heavily promoting gender-affirming care as if the government can set the standard of care, just sort of by fiat, it's clearly part of the objective. But we know there's another objective as well, and part of that is money. Some of it's ideological, but part of it's money. Some of you may have seen the, the clips that Matt Walsh posted on his Twitter account where he obtained recordings from Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt's gender clinic, where before they, or they were in the process of opening it or just starting it, and one of the gender clinicians was standing up there making the case for why Vanderbilt needed to have this gender clinic, because it's big money. Because when you do a double mastectomy on a girl, yes, it costs $10,000, but it actually brings in about 100000 once you're charging for everything else. And once you put these kids on hormones, many of them are patients for life. So there's a lot of motivations there. So to get to the transition point, realize it's all of a piece. It starts with social transition. It's not a waiting room. That's, you're on the conveyor belt if you start with social transition. There was a study that came out earlier this year that purported to say that kids who, well, what it did find was kids who identify as trans very young persist in that identification five years later. And the way that was spun was these kids know who they are. Now, we're talking about kids who are between like 5 and 12, I think it was, or maybe 7 and 12 when they first identified as, as transgender. Um, what it shows, and not all of them were diagnosed even with gender dysphoria, they just said, I'm trans. What this really shows is that if a child says they're trans and adults go along with it and validate it, affirm it, let them change their clothes, change their hairs, even before hair, their name, their pronouns, it's going to be really hard for a kid to undo that. It's going to be really hard for a kid to question, am I really, quote, trans? It's hard to reverse course. That's what this shows, that when you start a child down that social transition path, it's very hard to get off of it. And in fact, we've seen that in some of the other studies um, from the UK 
And what they found was kids who were referred to the gender clinic, who started down this path, again, most of them stayed on it. It's hard to backtrack. Think about what's happening here. Again, think of those underlying responses. One of the books that Dr. Sodegren mentioned, it was just simply called Gender Dysphoria, written by two therapists. One of, the, one of the compelling points that they make in that book is that you have to look at this trans identification as a maladaptive um, coping mechanism. It's a response to a very real perception of pain, discomfort, something's not right in my life. But it's a maladaptive coping mechanism. And I think that's an important thing to understand. So after social transition, oh, social transition, now uh, the medical centers are getting behind what used to be considered kind of fringe things because they're actually harmful physically. But in addition to a child changing their hair, their name, all these things, they are oftentimes encouraged to engage in binding or tucking. Binding is where girls will wear a, a very tight compression kind of bra, but it, it's really, it's much tighter than that. They can restrict their breathing, cause damage to the ribs, et cetera. Why? To help them create that appearance of being masculine. And boys are encouraged to engage in tucking, which means they, they do, they tape up or use certain kinds of special underwear to put their testicles out of sight and, and put their, their penis bent back and, and tucked up there. It's unhealthy. It causes problems. But now our medical centers are even promoting this as an interim kind of thing that a child can do when they're not ready for those hormones. After a social transition, if you've got a young child, puberty blockers is the next step. When a child is on the cusp of puberty, think about the logic. If you are a child, let's say a boy who's presenting as a girl, you probably pass like a girl because kids, you know, before they go through puberty, they, if you grow a boy's hair long, he might look like a girl. But his anxiety is going to hit, you know, go off the charts. Why? Because the closer that he gets to puberty, the more it's clear that his body is going to out him because his voice is going to crack. He's going to get peach fuzz because his body has a natural pathway. When it hits puberty, it wants to develop to be a mature man. So the medical solution to that is, well, we'll put you on puberty blockers. We will sort of freeze frame, pause. The problem is puberty is a whole body process. You can't just pause the peach fuzz and, and the, the voice dropping or even the growth of the genitals. It's a whole body process. So originally, uh, the Dutch started this protocol. And originally, they did it at older ages. It was in the US that we dropped the age to now it's like 9 or 10, right on Tanner stage 2 when kids are starting puberty. But, but what, what we found is it's neither safe nor reversible. That was the promise. It's safe and fully reversible because we use similar drugs with kids who have precocious puberty. But kids who are identifying as trans have a perfectly healthy body. So when you introduce puberty blockers, you are engaging in a medical intervention that changes a child from a healthy state on the verge of going through something their body says is, is this is the normal time to do it, and you're intervening by adding these puberty blockers, and they carry ramifications. We know they have consequences to bone development, the mineralization of the bones, the development to even of bone size. The earlier you put, for example, a boy on puberty blockers, the more likely it is that his hips are not gonna resemble male hips. So things like that. It's, it's, um, we also are unclear on what the ramifications are for brain development intellectual development. We know it hinders emotional and psychological and social development because if you block puberty and all their peers are racing ahead, developing, going through puberty, and they're not, they're going to look like the 10-year-old, even if they're 13 or 14, in a crowd of 13 and 14-year-olds. And that creates its own pressure. So one, one thing before I forget, the FDA just came out with a warning over the past couple of months that the use of puberty blockers in rare circumstances can cause problems in the brain that can lead to blindness. Remember, we're talking about a healthy kid. You introduce these things and you are creating problems that can have lifelong repercussions. 
So if you have a kid on puberty blockers, everyone else is racing towards uh, maturity, they want to go through puberty. But again, they've, they're perpetuating this appearance of being like the opposite sex. So they want cross-sex hormones. They don't want to go through their regular puberty. But when you add cross-sex hormones to puberty blockers, you get a child who is sterile for life. Because puberty blockers prevent the maturation of their reproductive organs, so they're not mature. And then when you add the cross-sex hormones to the immature genitals and reproductive organs, that child is sterile. So that's what we're talking about here. That's why there's such a coalition of people who are starting to speak out and push back against this, people who are not necessarily people of faith, people with whom we probably share very little else in common with except a common concern for the welfare of children. They're looking at this and, and saying, why is medicine introducing these hormones to children at age 10 and then age 14, resulting in sterility? When these kids aren't old enough to drive, they can't vote, they can't own a gun, they can't do anything, but we're gonna, we're gonna make decisions that are gonna take their, their fertility away. And now we've also learned that it compromises their sexual function. And some of the gender docs have known this for a while, but they've only just in the past year or two spoken about it, or at least been recorded speaking about it. There was one, one thing on social media a couple of years ago that I remember seeing, but you know, so this, this prevents even, even if you believe in nothing um, more significant about life, like the purpose of life is sexual satisfaction, these kids are gonna be deprived because that combination, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones is gonna impair their sexual functioning later on. And it has permanent, uh, some of the effects of cross-sex hormones are permanent. So just real quickly back on this. Um, one of the things I often think about is when you put a girl on cross-sex hormones, you give her testosterone, within six months, she may develop a bad case of acne, which creates its own problems in terms of depression. And uh, if you have male pattern baldness in the family, she could start going bald about six months in. And, and so those things are not reversible. But then the cross-sex hormones are also causing bodily changes that can make them, typically there's a weight gain, there's obesity that becomes a problem in both males and females. So um, you, then you often, with the males, you have the worry about blood clots, just like you do with women who are on estrogen. You have cardiovascular implications, metabolic, diabetes. I mean, these are serious health problems that are resulting here. I'll skip over that. And then you get to surgery. You know, when I first was working on this, you didn't hear much. Well, what you heard from the gender clinics was nobody's doing surgery. Actually, not from them, but from the activists, because they were doing surgery. In fact, they've been doing it for quite a while. In 2019, Boston Children's opened up the first children's gender clinic surgery center. Why? So that they can do surgeries, such as double mastectomies, um, castrating kids, removing their testes, removing their ovaries, even removing genitals on boys as young as 15. How do we know? Because there are studies reporting this. And unfortunately, it's become uh, part of the routine gender-affirming care. Those age limits that were listed, that was, uh, WPATH put out a series of new um, standards, and the draft included reductions in the age of, the minimum age at which you could do these surgeries. So that they were saying, well, we'll drop it. it. Within hours after they released this final draft, they edited it and they removed the age minimums entirely. Why? Because one of the gender docs was caught on tape explaining that we don't want to have any age minimums on there because if a doc chooses, for example, to do a double mastectomy on a girl of 12 instead of 13, we don't want to create a liability situation. So this is really happening. This is from an actual study showing this was back in 2018. They were reporting double mastectomies on girls as young as 13. So interesting sidelight of this study. What they found was for every month that a teenage girl was on testosterone, she would grow more and more unhappy with her breasts. They called it chest dysphoria. Why? Because 
she's got the peach fuzz and, and she's representing herself as male. She's got the testosterone going through her system. But every day when she gets up and looks in the mirror, she sees her breasts and she gets more and more unhappy. So again, the, the med folks have a solution for it. We'll cut your breasts off. There are other complications, obviously, from all of these surgeries. In fact, the rate of reoperation because of complications is, um, is significant, particularly once you're talking about genital surgeries. Those surgeries have much higher rates of complications. So I show you this picture for two reasons. The picture on the left with the, the arm is to show you kind of the, the actual results of a girl who goes through a phalloplasty surgery. I'm not showing you the phalloplasty, the, the um, manufactured neopenis, as they call it. But they had to take that skin from somewhere. So they literally skin her arm, or they skin her thigh, or they take skin from her back to roll it up in a tube, then to use tubing and, and extend the urethra so that she can try to urinate standing up. The complications are horrendous, but that's how it heals. That's supposed to be the good outcome, that her arm is scarred then for life. The other picture is of a teenager who went through a double mastectomy, one of the major gender surgeons down in Florida. But what I want you to notice about that picture is this. You look at her body, and you can see the scars of self-harm. This is a young teenage girl who is hurting who has suffered such emotional distress that she has extensively been engaging in self-harm. And yet the solution proposed for that is to remove her breasts. It doesn't get to the wound. Dr. Patrick Lappert, who's a plastic surgeon and who gave the talk here back in March, one of the things that he says is that as a plastic surgeon, they're taught when someone comes in and is requesting, let's say, a nose job, they have to really kind of psychologically assess them to see if this person is seeking plastic surgery to address an interior wound. Because that person is going to be very dissatisfied because you can't fix interior wounds with surgery. And that's what's happening here. We have children with serious interior wounds. Just to point out, this is a continuing growth industry. So because that combination of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones makes kids sterile, and kids who don't do the puberty blockers but go on cross-sex hormones likely have compromised fertility. It's the data's, um, there's a variety of data. We don't have long-term data on that. Medicine has a solution. We will engage in fertility preservation. But again, it's a promise that doesn't deliver because when a child who's immature, no one's been successful in creating ova, for example, from just, um, tissue removed and cells removed from the ovaries, immature ovaries. You know, so it's, it's just a, it's a business model. It's a business model. Why would parents go through this? Because they are emotionally manipulated very often. Some of them are all about it, but more commonly, at least with kids who are middle school and high school or high schools, parents turn to the experts. The experts say, you have to do this or your kid's going to commit suicide. And unless parents do the research, unless they slow things down, unless they stop and think, what's going on here, many of them just, I'll, I'll do anything, because they love their kids. But it's just not true. And again, to their credit, some of the gender docs, I think they're looking at, at um, the reality and, and are engaging in a little bit of CYA, but some of them now are saying, well, it's just not true that if you say no to a child who desires transition, that they're going to commit suicide. It's not a cause and effect. What is true is that these kids have underlying psychological issues that predispose them to suicidality already. But transition is not a solution. And perhaps more importantly, the numbers are wildly exaggerated. So this is real data from the UK clinic where a researcher looked at all of their data to see, well, how many kids are actually committing suicide? And they found four kids over a number of years. Any child lost is a terrible tragedy, but it's not this epidemic that, that we think. Long-term data, mostly coming from Europe, mostly with adults, shows that, that, suicide, or that um, transition does not prevent suicide. In the long haul, 
what we see is that while someone initially may feel better, that within seven years, 10 years, their mental health is often plummets, but it certainly doesn't improve. So we don't see an improvement in mental health visits and we still see high suicide rates. One key study that I'd like to point out was a study that followed people during transition. And what they found was suicides were occurring at all stages of transition. And the average time that someone who did commit suicide, committed suicide, was more than six years after they started that transition process. If transition would solve the problem, if it healed those mental health issues, if it really was the solution to someone's uh, incongruence and, and the distress they're feeling, you would not see those numbers. So, and, and when we look at cohort data too, we also see that um, some people say, well, society, if it would just be more accepting, you wouldn't have suicides at all. It's just not true. Even though society has been getting more accepting, it has not put a dent in the mental health struggles and the suicidality that we're seeing in these young kids. The US is out of step here. Finland, Sweden, the UK to some extent, France, where some of the uh, psychotherapists in New Zealand, Australia, they are saying they're, they're changing course, not because of anthropology. They're looking at data and they're saying the risk outweighs the benefit. This is not delivering. This is not helping people. And in fact, it's causing serious harm. But the US is moving forward you know, with, with great speed and, and defensiveness and engaging in all sorts of innovations, again, growing the market. And I'm happy to make uh, some of these slides available afterwards. So finally, let me just leave you with this because I know I'm a little bit over time and I apologize. Some people, you know, we want to trust medicine, right? We want to think, well, surely, surely we can trust that they wouldn't be recommending something if it weren't really good. Well, unfortunately, we can see in the history of medicine that sometimes people move forward on things based on very little research or even erroneous research. We saw it with lobotomies. We saw it with drugs like thalidomide, which was given to mothers so they, their morning sickness wouldn't be bad and kids then were born without limbs. We saw it with the opioid crisis. It was not addictive, they said. And of course, we know that's not true. The same thing here. This is a medical scandal and it is causing tremendous harm. And one of the most powerful uh, group of voices blowing the whistle on this are detransitioners, people who have gone down this path and then if they started young, their brains mature or sometimes because they're experiencing the bodily harm and they say, what have I done? And they stop, they reverse course, but they have become really vocal advocates saying, this is bad medicine. This is not the way to help kids. Why aren't we asking them why they feel so bad? Why it's so hard to think about growing up to be a man or a woman? So these are some other quotes, being guinea pigs. I'll share that. Final point on the ethics of this. On Catholic teaching, you cannot engage in actions that cause direct sterilization. So puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, you're sterilizing a kid. You can't do that. You can't do that. But you also can't uh, remove healthy body parts when there isn't a, a serious proportionate reason. So for example, some women might get their breasts removed because they have the gene that says they are very likely to get breast cancer. That's perfectly permissible. Why? Because the removal of the breast removes the threat. It's not the same thing to say someone's depressed, they've experienced this gender incongruence, so we're gonna start removing pieces of their body. You can't solve the problem that way. So it's unethical. Catholic hospitals are not supposed to participate in this. Catholic doctors, the same thing. But nor should we be encouraging someone to go down this path either. So speak the truth. We know the truth about the person. We can speak to the harm because the data is out there and we've got the testimony of people who've been through it. We just need to have the courage. <laughs>